dropped, and it's showtime from downtown Winnipeg. Nice pass, a shot, they score! Shankly Cutter scores! What a stop by Hellebach! Nikolai Ehlers at the face off! Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets, hosted by Jets TV. Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. we got a jam-packed episode for you, and as I'm sure you saw on the graphic, Pierre-Luc Dubois is our guest here on the podcast. So 16 solid minutes uh, he spent after his uh, 35-minute media availability with uh, the, the media. So he spent 16 minutes with Jamie and Paul, and those two gentlemen are the guests here on the Ground Control podcast. Gentlemen, how are you guys doing? It's been a while. It's summertime. Oh, my and I, this, everything kind of came in the right way. And as we were talking over the weekend, we're going to do a podcast on Monday. We're going to talk about this. Pierre-Luc Dubois was kind of the icing on the cake. So glad that, to, to have him join us. Well, you know, it was only before, I think, the draft that there was a lot of question marks about the team. Like the coaching staff wasn't in place and the draft was going to happen and free agency. And what about Pierre-Luc Dubois? And we've got some answers to some of those questions. So what I like about where we are three weeks later or so is that you're advancing toward September and training camp starting. So this is kind of exciting, even though, you know, it's prime weather season here in Southern Manitoba and, and not a lot of people are thinking necessarily about hockey right now and enjoying the weather and times, but at the same time, the hockey business never stops. So it's great to have some news to report on and most of it positives from that standpoint. So yeah, it's been great. And we'll see what happens as we continue to kind of move down the road toward toward the the team getting back to uh, another training camp under a brand new coaching staff. Yeah. And I think as as fans, you just want everything to happen at once and you want to know what's going to happen. But like you said, it's a it's a this is a twelve month a year business, and things will slowly happen as they happen. So, it's end of July. We've got Pierre Luc Dubois signed now. There's still some things probably to trickle out here. Uh, Mason Appleton has some arbitration dates set, so there's still more news to be had. But lots to talk about for us on the podcast. Like I said, Pierre Luc Dubois joins us as our guest. We'll talk about the backup goaltender position in David Riddick or Riddich rather. Uh, and then all the free agent signings that happened, uh, I'll go through those in a little bit. Uh, and then obviously the coaching staff has been rounded out. Rick Bonus has been named head coach of the Winnipeg Jets, and he rounded out his staff. So Jamie will touch on that. And then uh, on the back half of the podcast, after the interview, we'll talk about some of those uh, contracts that still need to be signed. And there's some cap space available, so it'll be interesting to see what Kevin Sheveldayov and crew do there. And then uh, we'll just talk, like hockey fans here, big bomb on Friday night after the Bomber game or in the fourth quarter. Uh, Matthew Kachuk traded to the Florida Panthers for quite a haul. So uh, definitely lots to talk about on the podcast. But we'll start with you, Paul. Pierre-Luc Dubois, he's sort of the topic of conversation here over the last few days. Signs a one million, or sorry, a one-year deal worth $6 million per year. Just your initial thoughts on, on the contract that uh, the Jets got from him. Well, a couple of thoughts after he addressed the media. Quote, unquote, I didn't ask for a trade. So that dispels all of those rumors. Um, he said, finally, you get to hear it from me, the source of how things were communicated between his camp and his agent in Pat Brisson. And also, you know, my job is to play hockey again, end quote. So this was... I think any time that you get Montreal involved, and it's just been that way since the dawning of time and and, and a metal blade hit the ice, that it's just going to perpetuate to, of course, they love their own, right? And they would love to have Pierre-Luc Dubois play there. And there's maybe a bit of a hint that, sure, why wouldn't he want to play there? It's his hometown. It's... And I understand that because if you asked some guys from Winnipeg in a certain situation that don't play for the Winnipeg Jets, would you like to come home? Yeah, that would be a consideration for us. So why wouldn't it be? I I get all of that. Mm -hmm. So he addresses the media and and he clears the air and it's a one-year deal and he's 24 years old and he's got a future ahead of him and they still control him, that being the organization, for this contract and one more. But it does buy time for the organization. What it does is it settles things down. There's no hole between Shifley and Lowry in your number two or 1A center position. Yeah, you're going to return with essentially the same group that I think to a 
to a player, to a man, says that they disappointed not only in the way they played individually, but as a team. There's motivation there. I'm okay with this because it does allow you to kind of set your course for how you want to look in the next coming 12 months or 18 months. Remember, Pierre-Luc Dubois is on a one-year deal. You've got two years starting left with Shifley, two years starting left with Wheeler. There's going to be some decisions that are going to be hard to make here. But having said that, what this allows you to do is have that rebound season that everybody's talking about, including Pierre-Luc Dubois. I don't have a problem with this one-year deal. Things can change, as he mentioned. Things can change in the favor of the Winnipeg Jets, their fan base, and Pierre-Luc Dubois, and maybe a long-term contract in a year if things go favorably. What happens if the Winnipeg Jets make a real deep run? And Pierre-Luc Dubois says, hmm, I would like to maybe be part of this for one more year again. Those are the types of validity types of situations that can transpire over the course of 12 months. It's a short period, but it can be a long period in the life of hockey. 28 goals, 60 points, over 100 penalty minutes. Like I said, a 1A center, a hard guy to replace. So in this situation, I think that everything is harmonious for the Winnipeg Jets and Pierre-Luc Dubois. He's still under control. You still have your number 1A or number two center and I think given the fact that you've got the same group together and they are motivated this is not a bad situation for all parties involved including Jets fans who are going to get to watch a player that I think will be very motivated to have even a better season than he did last year I would agree with all of that Paul now David Riddich he is the man the Jets signed as the backup goaltender or that's the role mm-hmm. that they're planning for him to fill when Eric Comrie stepped away from the Jets and signed with the Buffalo Sabres. Obviously, that was an area that needed to be addressed. And when you looked at the free agent goalie market, it, it wasn't, uh, what, what's the word? Robust. Robust. <laughs> However, David Riddich comes in, signs a one-year deal with the Winnipeg Jets at, I believe, 800000 You know, he had some great success in Calgary, had a bit of a tough year in Nashville, but as he said on his media availability, you know, he was playing once a month, and it's tough to gain momentum, and, and UC Soros definitely earned a lot of those starts as well down in Nashville. So, Jamie, just your thoughts on the signing, and, and maybe this is a goaltender and a player that can return to some of his former glory, and heck, it might be a hell of a steal. Right, and I think since I've been here, this is year six, I believe, I'm or five, Losing track of time as it goes by. But I, when we when I got here, Lauren Brassois gets signed. And there was grumbling about that. Last year, Eric Comrie was made the backup goaltender, grumbling about that. David Riddich comes in, NHL goaltender. I think the Jets have a pretty good idea how this is going to work, right? They, they have a... They, had, they have their scouts. They have their ideas of how things – LB worked out just fine. Eric Comrie put himself in a position to go somewhere else because of this play this year. He was an outstanding backup goaltender, proved he could do that. So, And for Eric Comrie, he's not going to play 30 to 40 games here. There's not a chance of that. So you can't blame him for going to Buffalo because that's the opportunity that's, that I've been told he's going to have with the Sabres. So David Riddich, you know, you have another NHL-caliber goaltender to back up Connor Hellebuck will likely play more than once a month. There's a strong chance of that with all the back-to-backs the Jets have on their schedule, particularly on the road. So I, I think a savvy signing by the organization. They have an idea what they're doing. They've answered the bell many times in this category already. Yeah, and many other signings that happened on the 13th and beyond. Uh, there's, okay, it's a, it's a long list. Kevin Stenland, who you'll hear about in our interview with Pierre-Luc Dubois, obviously the Columbus connection there. Some great words shared about Stenland. Capo Bianco, the defenseman. Alex, I hope I'm saying this right, Limoges, uh, a young player signed on an ELC for one year, played for the San Diego Gulls previously. Ashton Sautner, who's from Flin Flon, a local product, uh, a left-shot defenseman. Uh, and then obviously Jeff Malott, Jansen Harkins, and Johnny Kovacevic, who are all familiar with with Jets fans. Uh, One name, though, that sticks out there is Jeff Malott, Paul. Uh, Just your thoughts on on what he could perhaps do in training camp that could maybe earn him a a more permanent role with the Winnipeg Jets. Well, I mean, let's not say that all these guys are going to be pushing into the Jets lineup. I mean, some of these are Moose signings. But at the same time, when you're signing players for the Manitoba Moose, you also are, I think, there's a percentage that says, what is their ability to translate their game to the NHL level in case we get into injuries? 
So the Kevin Stenland one is very interesting because this is a guy that's six foot four. He can play right wing. He can play center. He has some history with Pierre Luc Dubois. Maybe there's a fit there. Maybe he pushes in finally and gets an opportunity to be a full time NHLer. But Jansen Harkins, two more years, and we'll have a real good idea. Twenty five years old now, after this two year contract is up for Jansen Harkins what kind of player he's going to be. Like, he has been around for the last couple of years full-time and has got his feet wet now and has that level of confidence and comfortability. Now it's time to kind of build on those those offensive assets that you've had all the way through your career. Jeff Mallott is interesting because he's a bigger body. At 6'3", he led the Manitoba Moose in scoring and goal scoring with 23 goals. He had a bit of a a cup of coffee, if you will, with the Jets last year. But because essentially they're going with the same team and they haven't, that being the organization, signed a number of of high-profile free agent candidates to kind of move in and, and assume spots, you're looking from that growth from below and pushing up. And we were told a long time ago, your organization has finally arrived when that happens. And now we're seeing that. And so Jeff Mallott isn't just here for a one-year deal again. It's a two-year situation for him. So I think they have an eye as to his abilities to translate to the National Hockey League level. So that's what makes training camp interesting. You know what your first three lines are going to look like, notwithstanding the fact that you have to get Mason Appleton signed after that arbitration hearing, and there could be something that happens before he gets to that hearing, right? But you know what your first three lines are going to look like. And then the fourth line is probably going to be that push from your minor, from your farm system. And I'm looking forward to Jeff Mallott and Mikey Asamont and David Gustafson and Kevin Stenland and these guys fighting for those positions because I think that competition will make the organization from top to bottom a lot better. And then if it's a situation where a guy is on the bubble and doesn't make that team, let's see what he does down at the Moose level to try to be the next call-up. Paul Maurice always talked about that too, right? He said, if we send you down, make sure that you go down and you're ready to come back up by your play at the American Hockey League level because nobody can then deny you with the way you're playing from having that ascension back up. So I think Jeff Mallott is a candidate to assume one of those spots. And quite frankly, I can't wait for September to see what happens during training camp with all these guys that know there's about three or four spots that are available for them on that forward core. Lots of new faces at training camp, including the guys in the track suits, the coaches, uh, Rick Bonus and Scott Arneal. Uh, bonus, obviously the head coach, Arneal, the associate coach. But last week it was announced that Brad Lauer, who spent four seasons with the Edmonton Oil Kings, and previously before that was a, a longtime NHL assistant, uh, three seasons with the Ducks, two seasons with the Lightning. That's where his path crossed with bonus. Uh, and then uh, a cup of coffee with the Senators for two seasons as well uh, in the early 2010s. And then Marty Johnston as well. Uh, he comes from the Manitoba Moose, uh, obviously we, he, that's a name we know well around here, a great person and a hard worker and, you know, has clearly earned his shot at the National Hockey League level. So I'll pitch this to Jamie first, but Paul, I'll get your thoughts as well, just on these two hires by uh, the Jets coaching staff. Well, listening to Rick Bonus on the NHL Network the other day, he was asked about his new coaching staff and he said they're all good communicators and communication is going to be key for this organization as they get try to get back into the playoffs. And clearly with Brad Lauer and Marty Johnson, that is their strengths, and they will bring that to this NHL team. Now, Lauer's won a Western Hockey League championship with the Edmonton Oil Kings. He's coached at all levels, uh, professional levels, American Hockey League, National Hockey League. So a great ad there. But I want to speak about Marty Johnson a little bit. He's paid his dues in the organization, did a great job with the Manitoba Moose. Uh, that coaching staff was really put to the test you know, during the covid uh, part of the year where their schedule wasn't exactly the easiest thing to do. And I was I was asking Craig Heisinger about one of Marty Johnson's strengths, and he says details. So, I mean, you, you got to love a guy like that. So congratulations to both guys, and uh, welcome to the coaching staff of, of the Winnipeg Jets. I think this also speaks volumes that you're looking for talent outside your organization, mm-hmm. but you also recognize talent inside your organization. And you're not, a, you're not afraid and you're not scared to advance somebody like Marty Johnston. And Marty's biggest opportunity, I think, came during COVID last year when there was a couple of 
uh, Jets coaches that were sick with COVID. So he got kind of bumped up to help out. And that was maybe his opportunity to kind of get to know the players a little bit more, the the NHL sort of level of hockey and coaching, the speed of the game that's coming from, you know, all directions as a coach. Because it was, when I first started getting into coaching, it was it was different because as somebody once explained to me, as a player, you play your shift. As a coach, you play every shift. So the mental stress that goes into that. So there's a bit of a, a difference between the AHL and the NHL, but I think Marty's been around for, for quite a while within the Moose organization, and this was a, a real good bump up, a, an ascension, an advancement, if you will, and a reward for a guy that's been around and been a good soldier, and I think that's important. Brad Lauer, as you mentioned, a National Hockey League player. He's, he's coached at a lot of different levels. I think he understands today's new player from Major Junior coming into the organization here. He might understand Pierre-Luc Dubois and some of these younger guys a little bit better than, than some older coaches. And good on Rick Bonus and Scott Arneal for possibly recognizing that, saying that, hey, we're not fossils. We're, we're sort of you know old school, but old school meets nouveau coaching style. But we also need guys that can communicate at that level and, and the way that, that we talk to these players now. So I'm quite excited about the coaching staff that they've assembled here for a lot of different reasons because in a word it's very diverse it's diverse from being old school also mixing in some different age levels with these guys but at the same time experience and also vast experience from major junior right through to the national hockey league well you mentioned it there too like marty johnson is going to have connections that he built down in the moose with some of the players that are going to be with the jets eventually on call-ups or just some of the younger guys that are on this team already so Definitely looking forward to seeing what uh, that group can do with this team. Uh, we should also mention Matt Prefontaine has been retained as the video and analytics coach for the Winnipeg Jets, so congratulations to him. Happy to have him back in the fold. And then Nolan Baumgartner, obviously a, a name many Winnipeg hockey fans are familiar with. He's joined the Manitoba Moose coaching staff, and uh, Alex Matheson joins them as well as their video coach. She comes from the Ottawa GGs program, I believe. So congratulations to all those gentlemen for getting the, these gigs and uh, getting back into pro hockey, you know, it's it's fantastic. Uh, okay, Pierre-Luc Dubois, he is our guest. Say no more. Enjoy. Shop where the players shop. Jets Gear and TrueNorthShop.com are your authentic team stores. Make sure to stock up on all your favorite Winnipeg Jets and Manitoba Moose merchandise today. Visit one of the five Jets Gear locations or shop online at TrueNorthShop.com. Hi, this is Pierre-Luc Dubois, and you're listening to Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. Pierre-Luc, thanks a lot for taking the time. Recently, you spoke to the media for 35 minutes talking about your contract, a one-year, $6 million deal, an extension with the Winnipeg Jets, and then also about your situation going forward and comments that were made uh, by your agent and the perception that uh, you wanted to play other places and all of those things that uh, you felt that you kind of had to encapsulate and, and speak to the media about uh, leading up to, of course, this interview. How difficult was that day to sit down and speak to the media for over half an hour? And is it part of the business that the players really don't enjoy? Because I ask you that just from the standpoint that let's get sort of inside the business of being a hockey player at 24 years old. Yeah. Um, look, was I looking forward to this? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, you know, I enjoy, I enjoy, you know, working with the media and talking to media. I have, I have a lot of respect. Um, for all of it, it's not, it's not an easy job, especially, you know, when our answers 90% of the time are, you know, get pucks deep, play 60 minutes and, and no work hard and prepare for the next game. You know, it's not easy. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it wasn't an easy or normal, um, you know, interview or press conference or you want to call it that we just did, but it is, it is part of the business. Um, it's not a fun part of the business, but it, it's part of it. And, you know, I think, Fans want to know. Fans want to know what what guys are thinking. Fans want to know what's what's going on in your head. And um, you know, it's it's part of of you know, you're not just paying to go see your team play. You're paying to see players play, and you're paying to see personalities and and all that. So, it's part of the business. Um, sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it, it isn't. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's hard. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, when I want to become a hockey player, I knew that it wasn't all going to be rainbows and butterflies. The follow-up to that is, as I was listening to your address to the media, I'm sitting here as a man that's in his mid-50s, 
thinking that I've made all my decisions. I'm now kind of working my way toward retirement in 10 years. That's what I'm thinking of. But I also hearken back to when I was 24 years old and the decisions that you guys have to make. I couldn't have made a lot of these decisions at 24 years old about my future. And that's what it seemed to me was the basis for what you were discussing with the media was the decisions that come at you rapidly that you didn't want to make to get yourself in a situation that not necessarily you might regret, but at the same time would affect your future for years to come. And this one day at a time, this one year at a time sort of, I think, encapsulates again where your mind is. Is that correct? Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, it's not easy. And it almost feels like a lose-lose because, you know, when you sign a one-year deal because personally you're not ready, you know, you get – you have to deal with stuff like this. Um, but then at the same time, I'm making decisions – you know, these decisions I'm not making for, you know, somebody that I don't know that is a fan of, of a team or either team or my team or the other. I'm making these decisions for me and my family. Um, and if I'm not ready to make that decision, I get that people could be frustrated. But I just, you know, what I hope is that they realize and they understand that, you know, it's, it's not easy. It's not as easy as I know. Like, I don't have a job where I can one morning say, okay. I want to change jobs. I want to change cities. I want to go live somewhere else. I have a job that once you have your contract, you're there. So before you sign that contract, you want to be a hundred percent sure that not only do I feel good there now, but I also feel that in six, seven, eight years from now, if I have kids or a family or a wife or whatever, that I will be happy with the decision I made at 24, 25, 26, not just, you know, a decision that, I made hurrying up because people were trying to pressure me into making a decision. Um, it's not easy and, it, and it's part of the business, but um, you know, at the end of the day, we're all humans, whether you're a hockey player or whether you're a teacher, we're all humans. You know, my job doesn't define me as a person and it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't mean my life's easier or harder. It's, it's just a normal job. Like, you know, sometimes people see us as, as something else in human beings. They see us almost, you know, as, uh, yeah, it's it's not easy, but it's part of the business. As much as you weren't looking forward to today, are you glad that it's over now? Oh, yeah. I just went upstairs and grabbed water and felt like going up those stairs felt like I was 25 pounds lighter. Um, you know, it's uh, it wasn't easy. I worked out this morning. And, you know, I tried to concentrate on, on just being there in the moment. But, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking two hours from now, I'm going to have to do a uh, to a press conference that's not gonna be easy um but like i said it's it's a cliche it's part of the business um i've been thinking about it for a long time like i said earlier on on that said press conference there's a lot of said a lot of things said about me in the past you know month that are just completely false and completely wrong and the whole time you just have to sit there and bite your tongue and not say a word and not do anything not overreact um, and just wait for that press conference day where you can finally speak and set the record straight. And, you know, that's kind of one thing that I was looking forward to, to doing and saying, though. When you see and hear all the reports, how frustrating it is, is it to not be able to respond immediately to said reports? Oh, yeah. I wish I could go on Twitter like half the people and say, you know, and just say what I'm thinking. You know, I wish I could just go out there and just say what's on my mind and not you did not have to deal with it, you know, two minutes later. The thing is though, you know, you, in our business, people like and love to, to harp on one thing you said or one thing you did and carry it with you for the next 10, 12 years. So you have to be careful. And, you know, it was tough. Um, you know, I have a family and, and a friend group that I rely on a lot to, to keep me, you know, mentally and emotionally stable. Um, but yeah, it's tough. It's tough. And I was looking forward to this day to finally set the record straight on a lot of things. And um, you just wait and wait your turn. And when the time comes, you, you're you ready to go. Pierre-Luc Dubois is our guest. Paul Edmonds, Jamie Thomas sitting down with the centermen of the Winnipeg Jets. So one year contract for $6 million. It was interesting also because you said, quote, my job is to play hockey again. So tell us a little bit about the motivation that you talked about this coming season after a disappointing year for not only 
not necessarily yourself in terms of points, but overall as the team. And I guess the B part, have you talked with a lot of your teammates and is the same feeling permeating through the room that there is something that's motivating you guys this off season to do better for next season? Yeah, I think, you know, whenever you, you don't win the cup, um, you know, personally, I'm not somebody that the only time the job is done is when you win the Stanley Cup. Um, you know, my dream now and when I was a kid wasn't to have a great career in the NHL. It was to win the Stanley Cup. Um, so last season was disappointing in many aspects, and not only because we didn't win, but we didn't even give, give ourselves a chance by making the playoffs. Um, so it's very frustrating. And I know the group. I know the guys are hungry. You know, we, we talked a little bit after the season, and you know, a few of us – so text and talk whenever we can. And I know everybody's busy, but, um, you know, I, I know we have a motivated group and with this, the new coaching staff that we're all really excited to meet and, and to, to get working with, um, you know, training camp is going to be very important for us because we saw it last year and, you know, you see it every year teams that don't start the year off well are almost out of the playoffs in November and, you know, they're playing catch up hockey till, till the end of the season. So it's going to be important for us to be ready from the start. Um, I'm sure we're going to have conversations about what our expectations are and, and what we're trying to accomplish. But uh, I know for a fact that everybody in that locker room is really, really, really excited for this season, really looking forward to, to, to bouncing back. And, you know, when you have that chip on your shoulder, that a little extra motivation, anything's possible. You mentioned the new coaching staff. Rick Boness is the new head coach of the Winnipeg Jets. You, you said today that you have spoken with them. What stood out in your conversation with the newest head coach of the Winnipeg Jets? I think is his excitement to, to get the season going. Um, you know, his excitement to, to get working with everybody and meeting everybody. Um, this is, I think this is my first time that I have a, a new head coach for training camp that, you know, nobody's met or nobody, it's his first season. So I'm excited to see, you know, what's in store for that. Um, you know, I've, I've been through two coaches as training camps now my third. So um, I know he's really excited to, to get it going with us. And, um, you know, we talked about, about everything about the team, um, about myself, uh, about his vision for, for everything. And um, I, I know for a fact he's excited and everybody, everybody in the team is excited to, to get this going with, uh, with the whole, you know, not just him, but the whole coaching staff. I think in, it's loose for me, but in French you were addressing the Quebec media and you said about Rick Bonus about, you know, his track record, his track record, certainly in Dallas and then getting to game seven against Calgary this past season. So, I mean, he comes with great experience and with some teams and with some seasons of late that have had some success, including getting to the Stanley Cup finals a couple of years ago against Tampa. Yeah, your French is really good, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, I mean, I don't even know what to say anymore. Yeah, I, you know, I said, um, you know, he did a great job in Dallas. Um, they're a really hard team to play against, not not fun to play against at all. Um, they had good players. Um, you know, they did a really good job this year against, against Calgary. They lost at the end of the day, but Calgary was, a lot of people thought Calgary and Colorado were the two teams coming out easily of the West, and, you know, here comes – Dallas, that gave them a really good run for their money. So, um, and then losing in the Stanley Cup Finals in the, the bubble year. I mean, he's done, he's done a really good job there, um, and that's part of the excitement of that everybody has of of getting to work with him and, and then and his staff and see their ideas, see their you know their uh, their views on how we should play and our systems and all that. And not just that, but practices and mindsets and videos and um, you know the list goes on and on of 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 things that we're all eager to, to learn from him and, and his staff. Another thing, you know, that people kind of want to know is, and it has been talked about via reports is what the dressing room was like last season. Uh, you, you've mentioned before you guys enjoy being around each other. Rick Boness mentioned that in, a, in an interview on NHL network the other day, he feels that you guys like being teammates with one another. What can you say about the dressing room, Pierre Luke? Yeah. I, <laughs> like I said, it's funny. Sometimes you read stuff and it's, uh, you, know, you can't sometimes you can't say anything about it because eh, we just laugh and it's not even worth but you know the guys in the dressing room first we're all really eager to get going this year we're all excited for this year and to 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 prove that last year was just a, a bad season but you know part of that is having fun with it and part of that is enjoying being together and, and part of that is enjoying our time away from the rink with each other um you know it's it's not just you come to the rink you know sometimes it's team dinners um 
sometimes it's it's team events and 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 team christmas parties and halloween parties and stuff like that and um you know we're it's a great group and we had a lot of we had we had a, a lot of fun last year and you can't win without having fun i mean i've never been on a stanley cup winning team but I've known players and I've known friends that have won the cup. And, you know, one of the first things they said is that it was the best year of their life, you know, with the team, everybody had so much fun together and everybody enjoyed their presence. So we, we got to keep going with that next year. Cause you know, last year we, we, uh, we did a good job of that the year before, unfortunately it was a COVID year where, you know, you have to sit five feet away from a guy at the table, same dinner table. So, um, you know, I'm looking forward to, to getting to know the guys even more this year. One more for each of us. And so I'll start. And that is you, you mentioned that you, and you were very candid with your comments today, by the way. So thank you very much, because I think it answered a lot of questions for people, both in French and English. You didn't ask for a trade, and you're excited to get back to Winnipeg, and you believe that there's a real good team here. It's essentially the same group. It really is. All of the foundational pieces are the same from last year. So in your mind, what do you guys need to do differently that you didn't do last year with the same group to have better success in 2022, 2023, when you break camp in September? I think from the start, um, everybody has that motivation. So I think that's taken care of. I think nobody comes in thinking, oh, last year was great. You know, I'd just be the same. I, I think from the start, everybody's on the same page. So th that'll be great. And then from there, I think it's, it's the same, same kind of concept, just different, um, maybe a broader term. Um, you know, I think we have to be on the same page of how we're going to play. Um, you look at the, the best teams in the NHL, in my opinion, every night, every game, every period, every shift, they play the same way. You know, they have they have their idea of how they're going to play. Are they going to play faster? Are they going to play slower? Are they going to stretch? Are they, you know, so I think for us this year, it'll be important that everybody is on the same page of what we have to do because, you know, systems are great, but if not everybody, if, if we're not all in it, you know, best system doesn't mean anything if, you know, every guy on the team is in, on the same page and knows what they have to do at what time on face-offs, on four checks, on everything. So I think uh, from from the first day of training camp when we're going to be, you know, learning the new systems and everything, it'll be important for everybody to to be uh, to be ready to go and to be ready to every night, every practice, every shift to be on that same page. Right from the start of the year, you were paired with Kyle Connor. I we're not quite sure how the lineup is going to look like, but what can you build off from last year? The success you had with number eighty-one. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I loved playing with him last year, and we have a lot of good players. So you know, you could put me anywhere. I mean, the year before, I played every position. Uh, obviously, I prefer center, but I'll play anywhere with anybody. Um, but last year with KC was was great. He's unbelievable player. Um, you know, he. I don't. Yeah. I, I stopped counting how many goals he scored after 40. So, um, you know, he's, he's a, a special, special player. And, and if I get the chance to play with him again this year, I'm sure we're going to build off, you know, what we learned from each other last year. And um, I'm going to go to Michigan at some point in the summer uh, to get on the ice with him. And, you know, we'll see, uh, we'll see how that goes, but I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to, to, to seeing everybody, you know, seeing what the lineup's going to be and all that. And, and then from there, and even, even a little side note, Kevin Stenland, if he, I was with him in Columbus, I think he's a great player. Um, I've always thought he was a great player and um, I'm excited to see him at, at camp and to see if, you know, what he can do. We saw it last year with, with Evgeny Sveshnikov and, um, you know, I thought he had a good year and, but Kevin Stenland's a, a great player uh, that, you know, maybe, maybe he's on our line too. Who knows? Um, so yeah, I'm just looking forward to training camp and, and seeing everybody. Pierre Luke, thanks very much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. The extra, the over and above, the added value, if you will. And, uh, you know, we can't thank you enough uh, for clearing the air and then spending that time with us. Uh, have a great rest of the summer, and we'll see you in September. Thank you, MSC. Thank you very much. Thanks so much to Pierre Luke for taking the time with us. Uh, appreciate it, as always. And that was, a, that was a great interview. I really enjoyed that. You guys? I loved it. I, I thought the one advantage of being able to talk to somebody after a media availability is just uh you know you get to go over what was said and i thought he was very candid about many things and the one thing i've always enjoyed about pld is he's pretty open yeah when the opportunity presents itself he doesn't hold back and that's the, the one thing i have uh, grown to appreciate about pierre luc dubois in the two years that i've covered him yeah his guard isn't held as high as as other players mm -hmm. and i think that you feel like you can get a a real good back and forth with him when 
when you do talk to him, and hopefully that was uh, translated through the 16 minutes that we had with him. I appreciate his time and his openness and, and just the fact that he was uh, available to come on and, and talk with us. And I'm glad that he's around for another year because he's a great interview. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, for guys like us that, that have to talk to him in that format and create content uh, for radio stations and for digital platforms and things, um, he's always a go-to guy because he always has a thoughtful answer, and it's not just cliché. Yes, even, and I love when they refer to their answer as cliche. So that's that's good. That's when you know they get it. All right, uh, lots to talk about mm-hmm. still. Uh, Mason Appleton and David Gustafson; those are the two RFAs that the Jets still have to sign. Appleton does have an arbitration date uh, in August. Gustafson, he is not arb eligible as of yet. So there's still some work to be done there. But one could conceive that there will be some cap space left mm-hmm. uh, once those two contracts get done. Uh, it could come in the you know seven to six million dollar range. Do you think the Jets will spend to that, or do you like? Is it a wait and see approach? I know they're they are famous for signing guys kind of a little bit closer to camp, PTOs, that mm-hmm. type of thing. So the story is not finished. I don't think. No, and, and Paul touched on you know, of all the players that are within the organization that are going to be pushing for spots uh, in the forward group. Clearly, the defense is preloaded. So I just don't really see any room for movement uh, on the blue line. You know, you have your goaltenders. So if there's another free agent signing at this point ahead of camp, to me it would be another fourth line, you know, bottom six four guy. But I I still think they're going to leave themselves room to move and not fill to the cap just to fill to the cap. So uh, there's... They have a lot of bodies in their bottom six forward group that they can move around and, and feel confident that they can play at the NHL level. So I think, you know, there's there's a lot of options for Kevin Sheveldayoff ahead of training camp, and he doesn't have to panic just to sign somebody. Right, and I don't think that you have to spend just to spend to the cap. And the other thing that this affords the organization, let's just say that both Gustafson and Appleton come in at 1.5. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's $3 million. And then you're probably left with somewhere in the neighborhood of 5.4 million. It does accrue over the course of the season, and it might allow you to go out and make a trade to get that player that you really need that puts you over the top if you've had a real good start or you got to the halfway point of the season and you're starting to look to add and not subtract. So you start off with cap space. It's not a bad thing when you're starting to look in January, February about making a move at the deadline. Very good point by you there, Paul. Uh, Okay, the last topic of conversation here goes outside the Jets realm, but perhaps it could have impact down the road. Matthew Kachuk traded to the Florida Panthers in exchange for, okay, I'm going to list them here, Jonathan Huberdeau, uh, over 100 points last year, Mm -hmm. Mackenzie Wegar, Cole Schwint, a really top-notch prospect from everything that I've read so far, and a first-rounder in 2025. Just your reactions to the deal and, and just the way everything came about. Young player, you know, is basically saying, I want to be traded, and then it gets granted, and then it kind of sends waves around the league. Well, before we get to that deal, how things kind of transpired in Calgary in less than a week after Johnny Gaudreau signed with Columbus, and then all of a sudden, Matthew Kachuk is not coming back. I mean, they lost two stars in a week. And yeah, they got a boatload back. Yeah, There's no question about it. But they got a boatload back for one season guaranteed because Huberto and Weger are both unrestricted free agents at the end of this coming season. So the challenge now for Brad True Living will be to get one or both re-signed. And if he does, then the deal's even better for Calgary. And if he doesn't, well, then you're falling back on that prospect and that number one pick in 2025. But, boy, they've had to do some quick maneuvering here in the last week with two American stars that have departed. One on his own, the other basically saying, I'm not signing long-term. I really thought, JT, that when Johnny Goudreau decided that he wasn't going to sign in Calgary and moved off to, of all places, Columbus, that that kind of opened the bank vault door for Matthew Kachuk. Mm -hmm. I was wrong in that assumption because it didn't. He just decided this is not a place that he wanted to be. Florida came courting, and here you are. They get a great player in the Panthers in Matthew Kachuk. It's a little steep to be moving guys out. But when you had as good a year as you did, 
and then you didn't advance as far in the playoffs as you felt that you should, Mm -hmm. Bill Zito had to make, as the general manager of the Florida Panthers, some types of bold moves, and he did. And let's not forget that if you're the general manager in a National Hockey League situation, you're talking to your head coach, and I know Paul Maurice very well, as we all do. I'm sure Paul Maurice was saying, you can get Matthew Kachuk. Get him in here. He's my type of player. He might be the kind of guy that puts us over the top with points, with finesse, and some toughness and grit. Might not have been very happy with him during that play that play in series with the Calgary <laughs> Flames a couple of years I'm ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So but well, it's that guy where you always hear you hate to play against him, but you want him on your team any time so you can understand he is a unicorn. I've seen that term brought up quite often with Matthew Kachuk and um, I think it's a great addition for the Flames, So You're getting a top-line left winger. You're getting a, a top-pairing defenseman. Um, and you have some time to figure out if they're going to be there long-term. But I think of all the things that – especially with Matthew Kachuk only wanted to go to five places you know, around something like that. We had a list. Um, that – what Brad Living did is nothing short of a miracle, in my opinion. It's a quick turnaround in an extremely difficult situation. The sky was falling in Calgary after having the year that they did, and they've kind of rectified that a little bit over the last uh, – and from what I saw today, both players said – that they were interested in signing long term, but there's probably a lot of there's a lot of work to be done outside of that. Yeah, and I mean, like you talk about getting a tremendous amount back for Matthew Kachuk, and and if they can't re-sign these guys long term, at least you have playing cards at the trade deadline. No question. I mean, you look at what Kevin Sheveldayev got for Andrew Kopp. I mean, it was uh, there's a lot there, and I mean, they got into the conference finals, which allowed for that second first round pick, which ended up being Brad Lambert. But th- this is a trade that can kind of almost reverberate. Uh, into different areas, depending on how things go with those two in Uyghur and Huberto. The one thing for me, it just tells you that there is not one or two Canadian markets or markets in the National Hockey League where players don't want to play. It can happen to great cities like Calgary as well. And Calgary will tell you, and there's lots of surveys out there about being one of the top cities in the world, never mind North America, to live in. But you get two stars that ultimately didn't want to play there. So, you know, it didn't make me feel better about where we are and about our city and our organization here within here as the NHL level. But it also tells me that everybody's vulnerable to players wanting to move and the volatility exists in every market, not just some. With that, the podcast is over Thank you so much for listening to Ground Control. It's been a slice. Really, really hope you enjoyed it. And I'm not sure if we're going to do another one of these Ground Controls before the season gets going and training camp. Maybe. We'll see. Oh, there might be a request for an encore performance here. You <laughs> might be forced to, Tyler. Oh, well. We're going to have to like Not from us, but from the fan base. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, they don't know that I spilled water all over the table. <laughs> and they don't know that Paul Edmonds came in on his holidays to take this. This is true. So, Dedication, as always. Sacrifice. All right, we hope you take that dedication and seize it and enjoy the rest of your summer, folks. Have a great one. This has been Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets, hosted by Jets TV. For Jets news, videos, and more, head to winnipegjets.com. Proceed, enable.